Hi everyone and welcome to Miss Estrick Biology. In this video I'm going to be going through with you how you can plan and write up required practical one on enzymes. So if you want to jump ahead to any of the parts then just have a look at the time codes below to go to which bits are relevant for you. So before we start, because we're going through a practical today, I wanted to share something which could be perfect for you. If you do need extra help on planning your practicals or maybe understanding the results, understanding the data from it, then this is for you. Mathsify tuition. So why use Mathsify tuition? Well, there's a range of reasons why students choose to use them. It could be that at school they're finding the lessons are so fast paced and they just can't keep up and they want that extra support. Or it could be that although the teachers might be giving you extra help, there's a limit to what they are able to give you. And that is where Mathsify would step in and give you the extra help you need. It might be that you're passing, but you're not getting the grades that you really want to or need to for university. It might be that you don't know what you need to do in terms of revision to get those high grades. Or it could just be that you don't want to have another bad parents evening. So if you're thinking that you can't get better grades and you're just not smart enough and this is the way it's always been so it's not going to change and you just see everyone around you getting those high grades, then Mathsify is for you. It's not necessarily the case that everyone around you is smarter, they are just working differently and more effectively and that is where Mathsify can step in and help you. So they are really good at working with a particular type of student. Students that are ambitious, hardworking and really, really want to improve, but they just need that extra guidance and help to get them there. So if all that sounds like you, then Mathsify is a great way for you to improve. And they offer one-to-one -one online tutoring to help you get to the grades that you want to. So how does it work then? Well, you'll be paired with a particular tutor to meet your needs. And before you even have the first lesson, they'll work with you to work out what your weaknesses are to come up with a tailored plan to help you to remove. Then when it's time for your first lesson, that can be on any online platform that you have and you're already comfortable with, whether that's Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever else you might have. And if you are camera shy, then do not worry. You do not have to have your camera on. That is completely up to you. They'll always include lots of exam questions as well because they know that is one of the best ways to help boost your grade. So what are you waiting for? What you can do right now is click on the link in the pinned comment and the description and you'll see this form just over here. Fill in the details and Mathsify will get back to you within 24 hours and that will be your first step towards making those improvements in the grades that you are really, really wanting to achieve. Not only that, but Mathsify will give you a free gift once you sign up. So pause the video now if you're interested, head to the link and get started. But for now then, let's have a look at required practical number one. So the first thing to point out with this required practical is there is not one set practical that could come up. There's actually many options because of the way the title is written. So it could be you are given a question where you have to investigate the enzyme concentration or substrate concentration, temperature, pH or even inhibitors. Now the most common enzymes that are used in investigations are these four here, amylase, catalase, protease and trypsin, but again that doesn't guarantee that if it came up in the exam it would be one of those enzymes. So although in this video I'm going to help you to plan one particular practical, bear in mind that you'll need to use these skills transferably potentially in the exam. So the practical that I'm going to be doing is the one that I do with my students, investigating the effect of pH on the enzyme trypsin. So the aim of this investigation is to look at the effect of pH on trypsin activity to try and allow us to identify the optimum pH and also the range of pH values that trypsin works within. The hypothesis, which is a prediction based on research, the prediction I'm going for is that trypsin will work within a range of pHs from pH 4 to 11 and that pH 9 will be the optimum. Now for this experiment, this is the equipment that you will need. So stop clock, photographic film 
and that is actually the source of the substrate for this experiment because the enzyme trypsin can digest and hydrolyze gelatin. So what we'll see is the photographic film will go from being this black opaque color to colorless and clear. So that's what we're going to be looking at and you've got the rest of the equipment here if you want to pause and write it down. Okay, so the method then. The first step is you'll need to attach your film to a straw. Now we're actually using film that's already been cut and straws which have already got slits cut in them to slide the film in. If you didn't have that, then that would actually be your first step. Next, we're going to use a syringe to measure out four centimeters cubed of the enzyme trypsin and put that into a test tube. Next, we're then going to measure out four centimeters cubed of a pH four buffer solution and put that into the same test tube. And then that test is placed into a beaker with water at 37 degrees C and that is acting as your water bath. We leave that for five minutes and the reason it's five minutes is to allow enough time for the liquid within the test tube to reach the temperature of the water bath which is 37 degrees C. So the buffer that we've used here that is to make sure that the enzyme is at a particular pH and in this case it's pH 4. But we will repeat this process for all of the different pHs that we'll be testing at. Now for this one we aren't actually using an electronic water bath, it is a manual one. So the students would have used water from the hot tap or maybe a kettle and adjusted it using a thermometer to check until they got to 37 degrees C. So the next bit, once we've left it for five minutes and the solution is at the temperature, we'll then place the straw which has the film attached into the test tube. And at that point exactly, you need to start the stop clock. We'll then dunk the straw in and out of the solution every 10 seconds. And when we're taking it out, we're checking to have a look at the film. So I've got an example here. The top image is showing the film before it's been applied to any enzyme, then we can start to see that that black color is being broken down. Now it's not completely digested here because there is still some black color, but you can see it's almost clear. And that's what point seven here is going through. You need to continue to dunk and check until you reach the end point, which we can see in this photo. The film has now gone completely clear and colorless. And as soon as we get to that stage, we stop the stop clock and that is the time that we'll be recording. Now at some pHs, the enzyme may be fully denatured and therefore none of the gelatin would ever be digested. And if that's the case, we won't have all the time to just wait indefinitely. So after 25 minutes, if there's been no change at all in the film, then stop and record that as infinity or in other words, no reaction. So that will then need to be repeated for all of the pHs that you want to test. You should also repeat using water instead of trypsin in one test tube to use as a control experiment. And that way you can prove it isn't anything about the temperature or the buffer itself, the pH alone, which is causing the change in color and therefore the gelatin to digest. To record the results, I've designed a table here. These are the pHs that I'm testing, and I'm going to do three trials and then calculate a mean, and then use that mean to work out the rate of reaction. So here are the results that I got when I did this experiment. And you can see at pH four, for every time taken, I've written infinity, so it never changed. But for all of the others, it did eventually change, and we did get that end point, and we've got our varying times. Now, one thing you're expected to be able to do in your write-ups, but also you could be tested on this within the exam, is if you're asked to calculate a mean, you need to check to see if you have any anomalous results in any of the trials. And if you do, we'd need to remove those and not include them in the mean. So from all of these results, to work out if it's an anomaly, we're looking at the three trials to see are they all pretty much the same? Are there any that clearly do not fit the pattern? And sometimes it's hard to tell with only three trials and you might have actually needed more to tell, so you'd have to include all of them. 
But from what I've had a look at with my results, I've said that for pH 7, trial 2 is an anomaly. 540 is very far away from 300 and 289, so it doesn't fit the pattern. And also at pH 11, I had two trials where I had one at 612 and one at 600 seconds. And then trial three was 708. So again, that's quite far away. It doesn't fit the pattern. So those two I won't include when I calculate my mean. Now here are all of my means, but I've deliberately presented it like this to point out one thing you could be assessed on in your required practical write-up, but also in an exam. And that is how you present your numbers in a table. That's actually competency four. So here I've just written in exactly what came up on my calculator. But really, you should be recording them all to three significant figures. So I've converted all of these to three significant figures. And I've also put in my heading in brackets three significant figures to indicate that to anyone that would be reading my results. Now I'm going to use the mean to work out the rate of reaction. And the units here have now popped up second to the minus one. So the way we'd work this out is we do one divided by the time taken. Now for pH four, it never changed color. So that means the reaction never happened. So the rate of reaction is zero. The rate of reaction for all of the other pH values would be 1 divided by the mean time taken. And that's what I've got written here. But I'm actually going to do one final processing step, and that is convert these to times 10 to the minus 3. And the reason for that is it's much easier to plot this data if you don't have all of these zeros and it's easier for the human brain to actually process the meaning when you don't have lots of zeros so it's quite a good um, convention to convert it to times 10 to the minus 3 if you did have lots of zeros um, or in this case two zeros after the decimal point so there we go those are my results and now I'm going to plot them on a graph. And this comes to one of the skills that could be assessed in the exam, and it will be considered if you are being assessed on drawing your graphs in the write-up. Now you'll probably do this by hand, but I've done it on a um, computer here just to demonstrate the point. So I've got my mean rate of reaction with the units, I've got the pH on the x-axis, and the independent variable, so that is what you deliberately change, always goes on the x-axis. What you are measuring, which is the dependent variable, always goes on the y-axis. Now with our pHs and with the mean rate of reaction, we need to make sure we're increasing by an equal amount every time. So I've got that on my scale here. And when you are picking a scale, you need to pick one to make sure that your graph fills up at least half of the piece of paper you've been given. So I've got all of my data points plotted now. And one thing that you're assessed on is whether you should draw a line using a ruler going dot to dot, or should it be a line of best fit? And just bear in mind, a line can either be a curve or a straight line. A line of best fit doesn't mean straight. So it could be a curved line or a straight line of best fit. So the way to work this out is, if you do not have very many data points, it's unlikely that you have enough intermediate points to accurately predict a pattern to therefore use a best fit line. So if you have fewer than 10 data points, it should be dot to dot. And even if you have more, if you don't have a really clear outline of the curve or straight line, then you should still go dot to dot. So for example, on this one, if we did a curve, we would then have to predict which of these points we we're going to have the curve most close to, and therefore we're predicting which is more accurate. It'd also be assuming that 9 was definitely the optimum, not 9.5 or 8.5. So dot to dot for this one. The final two things would be the conclusion and evaluation. And to come up with your conclusion, always refer back to your aim and your hypothesis. And we said our aim was to investigate the effect of pH on trypsin to identify the optimum and the working range. 
and we predicted the range would be 4 to 11 and the optimum would be 9. So that's what we predicted. So when we conclude, that is what we're using as our basis for the conclusion. So one thing I'm going to point out as a conclusion is because we had zero rate of reaction at pH 4, we can conclude that trypsin was denatured at pH 4 and therefore it does not work at any pHs at 4 or lower in pH. However, we can't actually conclude at which alkaline value it denatured at because although we do have a significantly decreased rate in reaction at pH 10 and 11, it hasn't actually dropped down to zero. So that means there are still some enzymes that are functioning, so they're not all fully denatured. From this set of data, it does show that pH 9 is the optimum from the ones that we tested. However, we can't conclude that pH 9 is the optimum. And the reason for that is we did not test enough intermediate data points. We know that it's not going to be pH 8 or 10, but it could be at any pH in between then, because we only tested 8, 9 and 10. The optimum might have actually been 9.1, 9.2, 9.3, and then it could have decreased. So we can't conclude for definite on that. And then finally, it's the method limitations. One big thing to point out here is this is a really common question, particularly on paper three, to evaluate the method. Or it could be evaluate the conclusion, but within that you are considering limitations of the method. And when you are expected to do this, we assume the method has been followed perfectly. So you should never be critiquing the experimenter and saying maybe they didn't measure it correctly or maybe there were air bubbles in the syringe because we're assuming that they followed the method and we're just critiquing the method. So these were four things that I picked out about the method that I talked through with you. Number one, the endpoint was subjective. So when you decided it had gone completely clear and colourless was actually subjective, it was up to your opinion. And that will lead to some differences and therefore inaccuracies in the time taken measurements. The water bath was not thermostatically controlled. So that means that the temperature would have been decreasing during the practical. And that would have had an effect on the enzyme rate of reaction. There weren't enough intermediate pHs tested. We've talked about that quite a bit already. It meant that we weren't able to accurately identify the optimum. But also the range wasn't wide enough because we weren't able to identify at which alkaline pH the enzyme denatured. So we should test more pHs beyond pH 11. And that is it for this required practical. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up.